This podcast is sponsored by Shred Lights. Shred Lights make the most versatile flashlights in the world. They can easily be attached to any EUC, skateboard, bike helmet, scooter, e-bike, one wheel, and much more. These pocket-sized lights pack a ton of power in a small form factor to go where other lights can't. They are rider-owned and operated and known for industry-leading customer support with over 25,000 riders around the world who trust their products for their daily riding. So please check out this sponsor in the description below for a discount and also to support this podcast. I, I remember a key moment. Um, uh, there was some event or something that Elon was talking at. Um, I, I'm probably going to butcher the exact words that they had said, but I remember someone was, ta- he might've been up there on a panel or something like that. And somebody was suggesting from the audience, it was Q and A or something like that, that, um, that uh, methane was really the future and that electricity was a joke. And that, I mean, they're like challenging Elon directly at this like panel. And they were saying like, listen, yeah. you, you can't solve the storage problem. You can't, there aren't enough charging places. This was probably like five, 10 years ago that they were like really challenging him. And I remember, you know, arguably I'm a fanboy of, of Elon, but um, like his answer was pretty awesome. You should find it on YouTube. I forget how you, I don't know how you would look this up, but he just kind of like looked at them as far well and was like, they were like, what do you have to say, Elon? And he was just like, they'll see. They're wrong and they'll see. He says that a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, if you hate Elon, that's a moment where you go, what a smug prick, right? But if you love Elon, you're like, yes, he got him. Welcome back, everybody, to the Evolution Podcast. My name is Mickey, and today I have with me Mark Rice from Energy CX. Welcome, my man. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well today. Um, I'm glad to have you on because uh, some some of my uh, subscribers know this, but I've become like really obsessed with the Clubhouse app recently, as most people have been. It's kind of been taken off, and we actually met there. So That's like right. when I dove into Clubhouse, the first thing I thought was, let me just see if there's anything EV related on here because I'm <laughs> like that's my like aside from my day job, which is very different. This is like my passion, my side thing that I'm really into. So I met you and some other great people um, in a room and had some really cool conversations. And what really attracted me to hang out with you and some of those people was like, we don't dive directly into the same type of electric stuff. Um, so we have just a different world, but they're, they're a little connected. So I really would like to know a little bit more about you and your company and what you do. And I know that you're interested in learning a little bit about um, the personal electric stuff, like the unicycles. I think I think it's fair to say at the end of the last room we were in, or the, the main room I guess we were in, uh, people were a little astounded by some of the <laughs> specs I laid out as far as how wild these machines get um, in the way of electric yeah. unicycles. But yeah, definitely. Definitely. So here I can start, but um, I'll tell you what you said is funny. It resonates because it's similar uh, with me. I've, I've become, uh, you know, interested in this, in this new platform. So I sort of dove in having no idea what it was. And I became a little bit addicted for a week or so. And, uh, you know, just exploring all kinds of spaces. And uh, I am in the energy business and I have been for a long time. And I'll, I'll tell you about that. But but I also have a passion for EVs and everything electric. I drive an electric car. We've got, I've got uh, four kids and we all have EVs of our own. And I've, I've been an EV driver for 10 years or so. I started with the Nissan Leaf and now we're all, all Tesla fans. I love Elon <laughs> and everything Tesla. And in my business, we're actually partners with Tesla. So we work with the company for, with their solar products, their EV products. and. And probably the biggest thing we do uh, is their storage, their their batteries that they have for for businesses to use for all kinds of services that we provide. But um, so I, I also go in these EV rooms, although it's really not what we do or what I do for a living, but it's a little bit a part of it, but it's absolutely a big interest and passion that I have. I was on a good one last night, as a matter of fact. Uh, I don't think you were there. It was uh, a girl with PG&E, so we had somebody from California with the utility and her job there was to help uh, build out the infrastructure for re- for charging EVs in okay. Northern California, which where am I going to meet with somebody like that other than a place like this, yeah. this uh, clubhouse, you know, it was incredible. And then 
there was another girl who was, I believe, an investment banker that was involved in uh, taking some of these EV charging infrastructure companies public. And, you know, I, I just learned a lot. So anyway, I'm enjoying that. That, But what my business is, to your question, is uh, it's we're a, we're a 20-year-old company. So I tell people we're an overnight success. It only took us 20 years to get there. But but we have uh, a several thousand people working for us. Mm. And, uh, and we basically are B2B, so we work with businesses, and we help those businesses connect to anything that has to do with energy. So um, in New York City, for example, or in New York where you are, it's deregulated. There's about 20 states out of the 50 that are deregulated where the uh, consumers, and in our case, these would be businesses, they have to buy their power and often their mm -hmm. gas, and they have choices. It's not a monopoly where they have no choices like it used to be. There's still 30 states where they're fully regulated and you have no choices. But in the 20 sort of larger, more populous states, you have to choose, and that's called deregulated power. And we're one of the larger brokers, consultants, aggregators in that space. So we help uh, customers, anything from a hospital to a hotel to a nursing home to multifamily, some of our bigger customers are like data centers who use, you know, monster amounts of power, and we'll help them figure out what makes the most sense for them, find a supplier and find a, a, a contract mm. and even a, a mode to buy it in, that, will, that will essentially, if they're interested, will make them more sustainable. They can buy green power through that or solar, wind, but also just drive the economics because it's a large expense for most businesses. It's like right. their third or fourth largest expense. So we help them with that. And then we lopped onto that everything so that we're a one-stop shop. So if they want to be more sustainable and they want solar panels, we'll do that. If they cool. want to uh, be more efficient with uh, smart tech or LED lighting or whatever it might be, we do that. And we put it all together in a way that makes sense so that these things talk to each other. If they're tech, oh, they good. The common APIs and all of that, give them a dashboard to manage the whole thing. And at the end of the day, there's usually a very nice ROI, return on investment for doing that, so that this makes economic sense. So it's not just first adopter mm -hmm. tree huggers that we're going after. We're, we're trying to make this accessible for the whole world. Right. And we, and we even provide the, the financial piece of that. If, if they don't want to spend any money, then we finance the whole thing through uh, – uh, I call it fintech basically like PPAs, mm. power purchase agreements, things like that. So that once again, there's almost no cost for doing it, at least out of pocket, like CapEx, but they're saving money right away. So it's not just about saving the environment. This makes sense for their business. So anyway, that's kind of what we do. It's called energy CX. We're growing like a weed. We actually, uh, for our salespeople, if, uh, and we've got, We've got over 3,000 salespeople. So oh, I, I'm excited about what you're about to say. Yeah, you talked about this a little bit, right? You have a cool offering for them. Yeah, we, we, well, we, we have a whole thing, you know, to try to incentivize and motivate them. And we offer training. But in terms of the incentives, depending on what level they're at, we give them different prizes and recognition and rewards and incentives. And it starts off with things like a $50 gift card, you know, for right. closing your first deal, but all the way up to we give them a Tesla. So we, we, we actually pay for the lease of a Tesla. We do not okay. we do not purchase the Tesla and hand it to them. Okay. We own it, uh, but we pay the full lease and we pay for the insurance as well. Okay. Wow. So that they really have no cost. It's truly like a free So what happens if the, someone like that, you know, they do so well in their sales and they that's their their prize, so to speak. What happens if they move on to another company? You know, that With hasn't that happened yet. Oh. We're, we're like, <laughs> They're like, we're, we're stuck here forever. <laughs> no, no, we've thought about that. That's why it's a lease. So they, they don't own it. So should they decide to leave? I mean, they're perfectly allowed to do so, but we've done a really nice job of, of uh, I mean, I tell people all the time, it's a lot easier to keep a, an employee yeah. or, a, or for that matter, a customer. It's about 10x easier to keep them and retain them than it is to find a new one. Right. So we work really hard to retain all of our customers and uh, in fact, we have a uh, about a 96% retention rate for our customers. And our employees, I'm not sure, but we've, if we have 3,000 salespeople, for example, over 20 years or almost 20 years, we've only lost 
just a small handful of them, you mm. know, and some of those are due to death and, and, you know, all, divorce, uh, you know, all kinds of things that are really sure. out of our control. So the, the, the business we're in is very much a, uh, a residual income type business. I mean, it's once we are, we're serving a customer, it's, it's, it's difficult for us to lose them. So, um, and, and we provide great service, but I mean, even if we didn't, we're, it's just uh, it's something that's sort of in the background right. in terms of like say their power and their gas. So they they just don't have any incentive really to leave as long as we keep doing our job, which we do. And therefore, the you know our our sales partners that we've recruited and that work with us, they don't want to leave either because they're earning money um, off of whatever it is we're doing um, every year. It's a it's a residual thing. It's not like a you know sell and move on or eat sure, what you sure. kill. It's so it's you're, more of you're, a relationship for the long term. So you're connecting them with the power and infrastructure to make things talk, like you're saying, talk to each other and have a, yeah. a dashboard, that kind of thing. But you're not providing the power. No, no, we're gotcha. agnostic. You're, you're, right, okay. And we're, that's cool because then you, like you said, certain, some people don't need or want clean energy. Um, some people do. Sure. So you're yeah. kind of in... Are you seeing it's, an uptick of people that are choosing a cleaner energy source? Yeah, it's become much larger now, um, being driven by mandates, you know, by policy. Oh, yeah, true. And also by investors. You know, uh, uh, last week, Larry Fink, who's the the, uh, chairman, CEO of BlackRock, who's the largest investor, I believe, in the United States, or one of the very largest investors, they manage like I don't even know how much it is, but it's many trillions of dollars, not billions, but trillions. <laughs> That's a so wild number. Still, right. So here's here's one of the largest, if not the largest investor on the planet. Um, and he came out last week saying that they will no longer fund or invest in any companies. And they'll, in fact, divest from companies that they're investing in currently unless they follow like ESG. I mean, basically uh, what Larry came, everybody's got their own definition of that. But Larry's was... Yeah. That they have to have a, uh, they have to have a goal of being uh, carbon neutral by 2050, and they have to, uh, you know, as a, as a business, mm-hmm. and they have to have a plan to implement that right away to get there. And if they don't do that, they can't get investment from from them and many others that are following that. So now we used to push it. We used to have to call customers and tell them the benefits to themselves and the benefits to the environment. And, and it was a little bit of a, of a, of a tough sale sure. to get people to adopt these things. Now they're calling us. The phone's ringing off the hook. So we're, we're growing mm-hmm. and, and doing that. And we're doing it in a way that sometimes costs them nothing or there's at least a very high return on investment. So it's, it's working now, which is great. I couldn't have said yeah. that five, ten years ago. Do you, do you think that um, 2050 is... I don't know, like too far away, or do you think it's a it's a some, good goal? Some people, you, you want to know I, a lot. Some people, people who are very aggressive and very involved, would like it to happen tomorrow. You know, but it's, <laughs> it's just it's it's so unrealistic. So yeah, of course. Transition the uh, what, what we say uh, what our why is as a company is we're helping to lead the the transition to a cleaner energy future. You know, and and what that mm. looks like is so different from what it is today. I mean, the the power mix, basically power is used to, for transportation, like I'm sure we're going to talk about, mm-hmm. you know, for cars and buses, and, you know, mass transport, individual transport, private transport, like what, you know, you're involved with. Mm-hmm. And and then more than that is of the energy that we consume is is through the grid, is, is power and gas, you know. Is a, and, and, and the feedstock for power is 90% not green. You know, it's essentially a combination yeah. of electric of uh, electricity. Anyway, is a combination of gas and uh, and uh, of course coal. You know, which is legacy. It's something you don't think and about. Nuclear. Well, like, most people they say, where does energy come from? And they point to the, the, the plug in the wall. You know, <laughs> it's like magic. You know, where it comes from. Yeah, but I mean, that's the reality. It's it's mostly not green. And so to think that we can go to being like say a hundred percent green in terms of where our power is coming from, we'd have to drive 100% electric vehicles, first of all, because they're they're burning carbon. Right. And then and then and then the the the, the electricity that they're consuming would have to also 
come from renewables, which today are mostly intermittent forms of energy, which we really just can't handle. It just yeah, doesn't we, work. Have we not solved the storage thing quite yet? No, we're far from yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I was so thinking. Yeah, like, I mean, maybe one day, but but we're right now the, the, the fear is that even with the EV revolution that's coming on, even for things like the unicycle, that the, the components of the battery, the, the different uh, minerals that are in them, the, uh, the, the, there's a shortage of that, just just for the EV. And aren't they using coal to mine it? There's, there's, there, I mean, there's it a, gets a, real yeah. dirty real quick, you know. It's, it it's, really does. Um, even even windmills and solar, when you when you measure the amount of energy that it takes to produce those things, and that to, for one unit, and then measure the output of energy that it makes, and and put those things against each other. It's it's very disappointing sometimes when you do that. It's right. not you know what you think is green is in fact brown. It's, it's a, <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, all of us obviously we, I think we need to uh, march forward towards it, right? But I think that you obviously if you tried to, there's pretty clear uh, ramifications if you push too hard too fast. Um, whether it comes to you know just financial crises, job losses. Um, and just like people just balking up against, you know, especially in like Western world where we're pretty free, uh, anybody who gets feels like they're being pushed <laughs> starts to go, hang on, <laughs> I don't know if I like this idea. Um, so I think it definitely, you know, needs to, to happen just because as of now it is sort of brown, as you mentioned, doesn't mean it's not a good thing to continue forward with. I think it's just going to take more time than we would like, but uh, just some patience and some resilience, okay. I think. I mean, there are things I'll bring up, uh, Mickey, like uh, biomass, for instance. A lot of people feel that biomass is green. But since when is cutting down a tree and burning it to make power somehow renewable and right. and, and green? And, and, and you could argue that because clearing the forest is a good thing. As long as the trees are dead, but we're actually, you know, there's unintended consequences to a lot of things. Like, like uh, uh, with transportation fuel, ethanol, for example, is mm -hmm. one of those things which is terrific for the farmers in Iowa. And I'm not against ethanol because the idea is we're going to find ways to more efficiently make it out of, out of uh, vegetables and, and things that we can grow that, for one, don't compete for food. So it's not the food for fuel debate, which is a big problem, but also uh, that the energy density of what they of what we can grow and then convert into this fuel right. takes a lot less than the output. Right now, it's the reverse. As I understand, biodiesel is not that way, by the way. Biodiesel, you get more energy out of a gallon of biodiesel than okay. it takes to make it. So there's a, a positive impact. But ethanol right. is the opposite. Which So we're, I mean, to be honest, we at least today with the technology we're using, we'd be better off not using and, right. and manufacturing biodiesel. But yeah. the farmers in Iowa would go bankrupt if that happened. Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? I, I, I want to say it's been a while since I've driven a car because I, I live in New York City. Um, I mean, I drive them when I have to like go out of the state for whatever reason. But um, isn't it like one or two percent of like unleaded fuel has ethanol in it or something, depending on whoever the supplier? Depends on the state. Yeah. The, 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 the closer the states are to Iowa, the higher that Goes. Oh, that's you know, interesting. <laughs> mo mo most of the most of ethanol comes from corn, and most of the corn, I believe, is is grown in Iowa. So right. there's a lot of politics involved with that. I, I but don't the know. mandates are state state level uh, things. So some states use more than others. It adds cost, hmm. and the federal government subsidizes it to the tune of a dollar a gallon. So oh. it's a massive subsidy. Yeah, um, and it's still it still is more expensive. So. So there's the on the one hand it, it adds cost, on the other hand people argue about whether it even makes sense from a sustainability standpoint, you know, at all. But the argument, of course, is doing many of these things, even if they don't make uh, sustainability sense today, they're a bridge. Yes. To, you know, you've got to start somewhere. So you throw money at it and you create something, and even if it's not tremendously sustainable, they'll always find innovations. And find ways to drive down the costs and make it more sustainable. And that argument is, it, you know, I, I, I'm okay with that. And that's kind of what we've seen all the way along. Like solar's that way. Mm. You know, 10 years ago, nobody could make the economic case for solar. And, you know, the, the prices of panels have come down so dramatically. And, 
yeah. the cost of energy is rising and it's starting to make a lot of sense, especially in places where what it's replacing is more expensive, like New York or, or Massachusetts or California or Hawaii, for example. A, a kilowatt in Hawaii costs about 30 cents a kilowatt. Here in, in, in Illinois, where I'm at, it's like seven cents. Wow. Massive differences, different par- parts of the country, what, right. what it costs. Yeah, there's a there's a guy who uh, rides an electric unicycle down in Florida. It's a friend of mine. Um, he has, I think, an acre and a half of land or something like that where his house is on. But in his large backyard, um, he has a massive solar panel he's installed. And uh, he's one of the few people I know who actually was able to do something at that scale for their home. Yeah. And yeah. it, it's paid off. I think his energy bills are like, I think they're paying him at this point. Probably nothing, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Has to do with, you know, geographically where you are, if you have trees or anything creating shadows. You know, there's a lot of things that come into yeah, play. Yeah, his, his backyard you know? is like no trees. It's swampy yeah, and no perfect. trees. So that's it's, perfect. Yeah. It's actually pretty unusual. Most, most of the stuff that individuals use is rooftop. You know, they put it on top of the mm-hmm. roof rather than on top of the land, but but where there's lots of land, like in Nevada, for instance, they've got these huge solar farms. I don't know if you've seen those things. I mean, they're Yeah, I've massive. seen some of those, and uh, not quite the same scale, but I'm a big, I'm from Florida, and I've, I'm like a weird family. We love Disney World, but on Disney's property, they have, I, I guess we'll call them micro solar farms. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen that in Orlando. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, even, what's weird, though, I, maybe I don't quite understand the... the the rationale, but like in my father's neighborhood down in Florida, in South Florida, um, he's wanted to get some something solar going on for the obvious to try to save some money. And his like um, homeowners association said, it's ugly. You can't have it. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, nim- what? Nim- no, that's NIMBY, right? You, you know what NIMBY is? You no. Know what that? It's, it's an acronym for not in my backyard, you know? Oh. So, so many of these things people want, but just not in their neighborhood <laughs> or not – yeah. next door to them you know i mean I, I haven't looked too far into the cost but i know that uh, i believe elon created those um like roof tiles that look like yeah. roof tiles but are solar yeah. and i yeah. told my dad he needs to look into that he's just kind of slow to the yeah, punch that, but. his his hoa you know the homeowner associations often have rules like i guess where he lives they probably have a rule against it but yeah the the the, the solar roof is a promising technology because it's frankly prettier than Prettier yeah. than the shingles, you know, it's terrific, but it's it's not there yet. What what mm. what Tuss is doing on the solar side for residential is more along the lines of the traditional looking panels that you see. Gotcha. But but once again, you know, that's like the Roadster didn't make sense for anybody except for multimillionaires <laughs> yeah. when they first came out with that. And now look, they're making thirty thousand dollar Model Threes or you know thirty five thousand yeah. dollar Model Threes. So. I, I think it's going to get there. You know, I'm pretty optimistic about that. The, I want to talk a little bit about the um, the charging infrastructure we were kind of mentioning in the sense that, like, one of the largest arguments I hear from the people in my circles, um, whether that's just, you know, electric heads, people I know here in the city and across the U.S. who are yeah. very intrigued by green energy and their own, you know, electric vehicles and stuff, or, like, you know, I talk to my dad a lot, you know, so him um, is just, like, he would lo- he would like to get a Tesla. He'd like to get the thirty thousand, the cheapest model they got. He's like, I'm not yeah. a rich man, but I'd like to get into it because he's right. you know he's seen the stuff that I'm doing and he's just he's on board. Yeah, what's um, holding him back? Well, he's just deathly afraid of not enough right. places to charge. Range anxiety. Yeah. Right? I he's in, he lives in Orlando. No, he lives right. um uh in Fort Lauderdale area. Oh my goodness, the 95 corridor or whatever. There, there you have nothing to worry about. There's so many yeah. charging stations and it's such a densely and plus does he live in a does he live in a place where he could charge at home? Oh, of course. One of the and things would, we talk about which is again kind of laughable is like he's like I don't think I can make it to Disney World and back or not back, sorry, just to Disney World on like a charge. Um but my, I told him my, I was my, like I think you can. I think you could stop for a fast oh, no. charge, like in the middle for half an hour. He and wouldn't even need to. Is the funny thing? How many miles from Fort Lauderdale to Orlando? Like three hundred. You know? So, so my range is three hundred sixty on my car. You know, these aren't the one. You know, the batteries keep getting bigger and cheaper and so yeah. forth. And Model Threes go. It depends on their different, you know, versions and whatnot. But the one I have is three hundred sixty miles. My sister so is you, also intrigued, and she. 
She lives um, near Fort Myers, so she's like in mm-hmm. Estero, if you've ever heard of that. I never did till she moved there, but um, yeah. it's close to Fort Myers. But her job is she's in like it's uh, child services, but for older people. I don't know. I forget. She'd probably yell at me if she heard me say it. <laughs> but she helps older people who are being like abused by their kids. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That's um, a big so thing. She, I know a little. So about she that. travels to like massively across big counties in like s- Southwest Florida. And she's like, there's no way that I could get an electric vehicle with my oh, job. I, I, I'm, I, I take the complete opposite of you. First of all, just think about the math involved, okay? Let's say your car goes 300 miles. You have a 300-mile range. Mm-hmm. Okay, most, most people drive, I think, 30 miles a day, 20 to 30 a day. That's the average. But, but so, so there you just it's, – it's a silly conversation because if you're, if you're plugging it at home, Unless you drive over 300 miles, you don't even have to have this conversation. You just don't even – you will you never go to a gas station. You just plug it in when you get home, which takes, you know, t- 10 seconds at the most to, you know, plug the yeah. the thing into the wall. So it's so easy. But for those who travel more than 300 miles in a day, when you drive – three, let's say it's only 300. When you drive 300 miles, if you're going 60 miles an hour, that's, that's five hours of driving. Did I do the math right? or something right uh well it depends on how fast you're going right but Mm -hmm. yeah so so if you're going 60 miles an hour on average that's five hours of driving i have to stop myself i can't drive five you know stopping every five hours is is okay there's Mm -hmm. it's no different than if i was driving a gas car which also might have a range somewhere similar to 300 miles and in any event I need to eat. I might. I need to use the bathroom. I mean, you gotta yeah. stop. You're, I even think truck drivers stop more than that. I, I think her her um, concept of what might be an issue for her probably is a little silly. But I think her main argument probably is, you know, each morning I don't know where I have to go that day. They just download me on like the different counties I need to travel to and how right. far. So her, I think her thing is like, you know, quote unquote, what if the first two or three counties I need to hit don't have charge spots even remotely they, close they, they to do. my client. Well, it's possible that you could, it's not as convenient as gas stations. That's the truth. But mm-hmm. like with Tesla's in particular, a really cool feature is it's such a, is you're driving like a computer and it figures it out for you. It'll say, where are you going? And, and by the way, it'll drive without you even driving. You click the button that. and you know, and you've got a driverless car and it will go there but it will also say, here's an option, you know, if you, this is the, the using, using a computer rather than like, like, like in a gas or an ice car, it's up to me when, when I get gas and where I guess this is a computer figuring out, optimizing it, you know, using algorithms mm. to figure out where to stop and when to stop and how long to stop. But the other thing that you need to understand is the Tesla infrastructure, for example, there's so much, so many places you can charge for free or for very little money they still offer all free? over the place not all for free but there's so many places like in florida if you didn't want to pay you'd never have to pay and even with tesla they they provide the infrastructure it's usually when you're on the road like i i i've driven to florida from here i've driven to ohio i've driven to yeah. texas I've how much longer Austin. does it take that i think it's a serious question that, we'll have I, I, exactly i would say it does not Really? Because it was well, when you're going on interstates, especially right, Tesla puts them. They're they're pretty smart, also where they've located these things. So, I, I I'm not certain of this, and and I don't represent Tesla. We just work with them. Sure, but I mean, you're uh, an, own, I think you're an like, owner, though. You know, you you're a I'm driver. Sure I, I, I do, but but anyway, I think it's like every 50 miles or so in the in the when you're going on. That's how often you'll country, find. A uh, charge spot? Yeah, every 50 miles. So sometimes more, I mean, most times less, I would say. The, the more densely uh, crowded a, a, an area is, the closer. Yeah. But, but when you're really like in the middle of nowhere, when you're going through the Everglades or something, um, they, they put them about 50-mile intervals. So, Interesting. And they're right on the highway. I mean, I've all, myself, right. they, I mean, not, they are literally on the highway. Like, you know, you don't even go a block off of the highway. So... And they conveniently put them near restaurants, you know, and yeah, and, yeah. and be- they're they're thoughtful about it. So Cracker Barrels everywhere them- have it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one. But um, depending on where you are in the country, they tend to put them in the more popular right. places that people like to go. And 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 
if it's a supercharger, you're talking about 20 minutes. You know, I know that's wild. 30 minutes. It's not. It's not very long. And that would take it to like 80 percent well, or something. Well, yeah, you, you almost, uh, you know, like with your with your bikes, probably you don't want to typically uh, charge it to 100 percent just for the the life of the battery, for the right. health of the battery. But you can. In fact, on long trips, most people do. I think they mm -hmm. advise you. You might as well. But whether, whether you go to 80 percent or, or 90 or 100. Uh, the fact is just the technology is so terrific that it charges it so quickly that you hardly notice it. Right. You know? And of course, if you want to stay in your car, you're sitting in a, you're connected to the internet and you can, you can communicate video chats. You can play video games. I mean, there's, it's right. an entertainment center right there in sure. front of you. I mean, but, it's but, the future. But there's a place to use the bathroom or eat too. So it makes sense. You know? and, yeah. and so I think like you probably know more about it. Like, what, some of these other, uh, I guess you would just call them traditional car companies, are clearly now have, have put their flag in the ground that, that they want to be involved in the EV revolution, yeah, hence oh, sort of sure. the, the name of, of this podcast. <laughs> uh, like GM, you know, put out the Super Bowl ad that they want. So I'm, so I'm charging my car right now. Oh, oh nice. Two, two, I, I have one at my office and at home, so I, I never... I hardly ever go to the superchargers, except for on these really long trips. Sure, yeah. So I think GM said, I could be getting this wrong, but like like 20 EVs by 2030 or something like that. Or no, is it 30 EVs by 2025? I forget. It's something like that. But like pretty soon yeah. they, they're they promising a lot of electric cars. Yeah, um, for sure. And I first thought like, can they build up the infrastructure enough around the country to make people actually dive in yeah that's where i'd like to help you out mickey most people don't travel more than 300 miles a day mm -hmm. right i mean i mean and when you look at that statistic i think it's like it's less than 10 percent. it's probably less than five percent right like what's the average travel, commute well th think about this i think if you if you lease a car you can go like twenty thousand miles a year that's mm -hmm. usually like the, the that's the max that's that's for people that drive a lot. Right. I think it's like ten to twenty thousand. But even if you were to use twenty thousand, um, what is twenty thousand? I'm going to do it right here with my calculator. Twenty thousand miles in a year, divided by three sixty five, is fifty four miles a day. So that would be if you're a heavy driver, you drive fifty miles a day. Right. But 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 ten thousand would be half that would be twenty seven miles a day, and that's what most most people do. I mean that's that's most people. So yeah, I, very I, few people use the, the you know these what we're talking about this infrastructure in the middle of nowhere for people that are driving mm. far distances. When I do use them, I've never I, I, I'm lonely. There's usually nobody there. There's usually like eight of them, or sometimes as many as sixteen, and. Uh, I'd say most of the time they're empty, but sometimes there's one or maybe two people. And right. by the way, your app tells you if it's full, but I don't even bother to look because I've, I've never seen one that's full ever. Yeah. I mean, that's so great about that. Like, honestly, like I obviously don't, as I said, I own a car and I don't own a Tesla, but I know some people that do. And I've seen the whole infrastructure via their app and, you know, when they're in the car and that's not exactly the same, but. Same thing, but for us uh, in New York City, for a lot of the electric vehicle riders, so e-boarders, e-bike, electric unicycle guys, yeah. over the years, the e-board community specifically helped build out an application that tells us all of the available charge spots in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens. So we have an, so we have an app that's like user updated, and then some. Even yeah. you know, if something is like, for example, ours aren't uh, official stations, right? They're like restaurants, bars, with, with side the plug, of the yeah. side of the road light posts that have available yeah. outlets which yeah, is pretty cool, cool that we have this little yeah. uh map and then obviously yeah. we can take it take certain ones down it's like hey uh we were blowing the fuse here too much so they they know about us take this off the, off the map yeah. so yeah well, it's I, super I, I helpful i can tell you too much mickey about ev infrastructure you know there's there's like four the four largest companies are chargepoint evgo uh Blink charging, and then there's a there's another one which isn't so big, but it, I'll just throw it in there, which is called Beam Global, because Beam Global is the only one that's not necessarily grid tied. It's one of these. It has a uh, a roof that's a big solar panel, mm. and you park the car under that, and your 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 
getting sunshine in your tank, you know, basically, right. or, you know, your so so that doesn't have to be tied to the grid because the ones that are tied to the grid, they they can be very expensive to install, right. where the labor is is actually more than the equipment. They can be as much as twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, believe it or not, because they have to trench a mm. cable through a parking lot or around a building or something just to get to the spot, and so that one's an interesting one, Beam Global. Um, and then all of the others, they compete with each other, and they're all, they all want to win the war. Uh, Tesla's on an island all by itself. They do their own thing. And they're, they're not, so for example, for me to charge my car into any one of those other platforms, I actually need an adapter. You know, mm. they, they don't even share the common, it's not like plugging into the wall. They for have sure. different, different things. And then, and then they don't talk to each other, so they each have their own network. They're networked, a lot of them. They have software where they not only tell you where they are and, and it'll, it'll tell you, you know, it'll map it out, GPS and all kinds of fancy things and charge you, you know, so that it's mm -hmm. all seamless. But, um, but they do not communicate with each other because they're at war with each other. So that's a bit of a pain. Yeah. You I know, mean, so, so you, you may need like three adapters. I mean, you don't need it, but most people pick one or the other. But if you truly wanted to have access to everybody, You'd have probably two or three different cards and two or three different apps and, and right, there's two yeah. or three different maps of I mean, it's just where all the of these things are. Bugs or features, however you want to see it, of the future, right? It's like yeah. when I consider, you know, it's a little silly, but like when Back to the Future 2 came out, we had this like hyper futuristic realm we were introduced to. It's fantasy. Yeah. But, um, I Anymore. often it's think a, about well, like how close we are to that in some respects. Like yeah. what are some, too, yeah. like what are some of the for, yeah. like this is weird, but like the back alley trash of the future. What will that look like compared to the back alley trash of Chicago from the eighties, right? Like yeah. or New York or wherever, right? Like so, like yeah. for example, like we might start to see discarded uh, car adapters, you know, near a trash can or, or a recycling bin or whatever. We might start to see, you know old caught fire lithium batteries in the corner near a brick wall. You know, like, I'm like thinking about those sort of like, what's going to be the, yeah. the, the trash of the future. So this I'm might be you. one of those things. I, I, I do that for a living. I try to predict what's going to be the trash of the future. And I find the innovators that are working on those technologies and I partner with them to get those, those technologies actually in the hands of consumers. It's like, mm. I love that. I'm all over that. Have you seen Solar Roads, by the way? No, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. Never heard of that. Happen. That's crazy. It was, I think, it was like the number one. Uh, what's the crowdfunding platform that's really popular? You know, uh, there's uh, um, like Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Kick Kickstarter. I think yeah. on Kickstarter it was like the number one crowdfunded thing, and I don't know that it'll ever happen. But the idea would be is that all the roads will be made of of recycled glass, and that underneath the glass, and the glass will act as a conductor to collect solar energy and then as you drive over the road you can actually chart your car will be charging as you're driving on top of the road i can already imagine <laughs> it's, it's just crazy but i mean it, it they have a prototype i mean that it's technologically very possible right who knows if it's economical ever but there's wonderful there's all kinds of things even today that or like make you think we're in you know the movie back to the future yeah oh, I mean, and by the way by the way imagine this you're driving on the road and the road itself lights up so oh, it's yeah. using the solar power to light up and it will and the road will tell you you know deer ahead or or you won't know well hold on i'm gonna i'm gonna just i'm gonna do a wrench in your your thing here yeah you yeah. you're gonna be having a car that self-drives so in theory you don't need That's fine even too. that no, you know? no, then it will well, yeah, no, then the road would wirelessly be communicating. It would slow you down. Kind of, it'd be like R2-D2 just plugging into the this in, yeah. info grid, and it will tell you what to do, you know? Yeah, that yeah. I like that's a fun future. That I spend in when I'm in the shower, I think about things like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but some of that is today. I mean, look at this yeah. thing. This thing would, would, would fill my office uh, 30 years ago to have this much computing. I know. Power, People don't. You know? So I was in like second, third year of college, second year of college, I think, when the iPhone 1 came out. Um, maybe Yeah, first or second, something like that. But uh, like my kids, they they have no, I mean, now I sound like an old guy, right? But I'm like, 
dude, they have no idea like how insane that moment was. Remember, right. we had rumors, right? We heard, oh, Apple's coming out with a cell phone. We were like, what a stupid idea. That, yeah. Everybody was like, what? The st- Apple, it was look hard, at them. hard to wrap your head around. That they I was like so cocky. That, yeah. yeah, I was like, they're, yeah. they're up their own ass. They, they think they're yeah. so great. They get a cell phone. What's wrong uh, with these how people? How could they compete against Nokia? <laughs> you know, <laughs> Where's Nokia now? <laughs> it's like, right. It was such now, a if joke. You, if, you, if you just think about the advances, and I'm much older than you, so, you know, if you think about where we were and where we are now and how vastly different the world looks from a technological standpoint, just project out into the future and like almost nothing is impossible to imagine, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then lo and behold, obviously the, as soon as it came out, it clicked. Everybody went, Oh, wow. I remember well, like, that's actually, that's the genius of Steve Jobs. You know, of I course. don't believe Steve is a was a great Visionary. tech guy. That was Wozniak. You know, he was the the, the technology entrepreneur. But sure. the idea is, how do you take those technologies and get them into consumers' hands in a way that that simplifies it enough that they get excited about it and they'll actually use it? Is there a rumor? You know, the, the, the Uber, the Uber app, or the yeah, yeah, or yeah. the Airbnb, or you know, and and that's exactly what we're trying to do in energy. That's really kind of what drives us. We're trying to sort of I hate saying it, but we, we, I don't really mind is we're dumbing it down because people who are into this, like me and you are usually have propellers on our head, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're, 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 we're the nerdy guys and we like it. That's, that's not the real world, the real world. They want it made simple for them. Yeah. We've talked about, they don't this. want to have to study and get a degree in order to do this. They don't need to know and what they, amps versus Watts or watt hours no, or milliamps. No. Like they don't want to know any of that. And they don't want to pay too much for it, unfortunately. So we've got to try yep. to make it economical and there's a lot of work that's been done on on the fintech side on the financial tech side to right. finance these things in such a way that it's also very uh it's not it can be almost unnoticeable i mean it's like in things. silicon valley they talk about reducing friction right so i mean i think it's been discussed obviously all over the platform on clubhouse which is like clubhouse so far is the ultimate frictionless um social media app because it's one tap and you're in Two taps, yeah, right. two right. taps, and you talk. I mean, right. t- Twitter is like rolling over in their grave because they're yeah. at least now it's like you got to do a lot to get to get on and, and right. say a thing. Where this, it's like, I mean, I have because I'm a, this is the kind of guy I'm, and I've got all the the stuff telling me when yeah. people I follow are talking online. You know, like there's probably been plenty of rooms. I mean, the other day, like you were in a room and I was like, oh, Mark's in a room, but I just clicked and it was just like know, hanging out. And I was like, oh, this is a room with, the, this is like a fun room, but it's like, oh, this is like a bunch of Jewish people hanging out talking about Jewish stuff. And I was like, this is fun. Right. Not what I thought it was, but uh, I thought the word schmooze meant, you know, like in my world, I'm in like the film yeah, biz. What'd you, what'd you think it was? Like people just like uh, uh, connecting and, you know, exchanging business uh, info and hanging you know, out. You know? I that thought it was like a, yeah. The way, but you know, Mickey, like with, with uh, e-commerce, mm-hmm. whether it's B2B or B2C, they measure the success of uh, converting, you know, people who get onto the technology, whether they actually convert, they, you know, they, they subscribe or they buy mm-hmm. or make the purchase and they measure it in clicks, you know, the, the fewer clicks to get mm-hmm. to the purchase, the more success they're going to have. So, I mean, it's yeah. just human behavior and it's human There's a dark psychology. side to that, too, which yeah. I, I like this. You know, it's a little off topic, but just that click culture has sort of ruined, like, media forever. Yeah. And I don't, yeah. I'm not really sure how we come back from that. I'm not an expert in that L- realm. Listen, how about your children? It might be ruining our children forever. I'm not so sure. Oh, yeah. You know, like, you wonder about all this ADD going on. Mm. Do you think it has anything to do that with one click they could get anything they need right away? I'll admit that you know? COVID uh, <laughs> lockdowns have made me worse with my phone. Remember every adult at some level has said to their friends, their colleagues, like, yeah, I'm on my phone too much, you know? Yeah. Lockdowns, I'm like, okay, I really am on my phone too much. This is a real issue. But I think I think it was Jonathan Hyde who wrote a book about um, like sort of how adolescent girls and I guess boys are – are actually mentally being ruined by the right. age of like Facebook and cell phones. And it's yeah, like, he it's did scary. a real great book on it. Um, so yeah. yeah the, people are concerned. And the truth is we don't know because it hasn't been around long enough to see the results. We're going to, mm. we're going to find out, but the, the, I, I do find interesting the app on 
your phone where you can see how much screen time you've had, you know, and right. it's, it's often a lot more than people think. Oh my gosh. That's what I'm saying, man. I look at that and I'm, I just feel like an awful yeah. adult. <laughs> I'm like, no, this is bad. And how about, are you worried about EMFs? Do you know about that? Uh, I do. I'm, I'm, I'm not in the sense of, I can't control it. I, I'm trying really sure. hard as an adult to like worry about the things I can control. Um, yeah. cause I mean, as any human, you probably worry too much about the things you can't control. I just, I, I'm like hoping that smarter people than myself can tackle those sort of issues if they are a real thing to be concerned about, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, obviously there are a lot of bad actors in the world, but, um, and money tends to corrupt things. It's just new, right? It's, yeah. Again, I don't think people know, like, for instance, is 5G is a great thing, but is that added, you know, the beams going through the air, is that okay for, for yeah. your, for your body for your cells i remember like when 3g or 4g oh, wow. came out there was also a concern like this but i think it was sort of proven that it, it was negligible or no big deal or whatever so maybe this hopefully the same is uh for 5g um <laughs> I'm, I'm with you i'm i'm you know? i'm in the hope i'm in the hope camp too but i, I, mean, I worry i do worry i can't that's an interesting topic too myself. because like 5g yeah. there's a lot of people smarter than myself who who study this and make content about it but like you know, like T-Mobile, right? They have a lot of commercials now about them having like the largest 5G network, but it's not actual, right. it's like fake 5G or just like subpar 5G. 5G technically at full bandwidth is, I forget what the numbers, but it's a really high number of like megabits yeah. per second and right. over like a thousand or something. But they're basically just giving you around about four to 500 in their like low bandwidth 5G all over the country and being like, look at us, we have it. So it's like, but maybe that's all we need. I don't know. But that's sort of like a, a thing happening. I, the, I'll tell you what bothers me is when you get an X-ray, they put a lead thing over you, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, and the, and you see all the all the warnings about too much access to X-ray. You know, to different types of, of things going through the air can be bad for your health. Mm. And here we're holding these up to our brains. Right. They're literally you know next to our brains or close to it. I, I, I'm, I'm in the hope camp, but we, we are working with some folks on, there are some things that seem to be, uh, have some success at mitigating some of that. Mm. There's different technologies that you can like even just put on your phone and it'll sort of mitigate the, the, the rays, which may or may not be harmful. And, you know, we're looking into that. I don't know. Sure. This might be something that we get more involved <laughs> with later. Yeah. So you said that your, your, your kids are all into EVs. Are you just, are you guys just all... Uh, car cars you're talking about or do you have anything that's more closer to like a personal ev well, uh we've had you know those little electric scooters we, we all have mm -hmm. ev cars mm -hmm. um and i'm not against ice cars I, you know i used to race professional motocross i mean I'm, i i like you know i'm not against using gasoline mm -hmm. out of principle but we we find them more convenient more economical sure and more fun and uh just all the way around but in terms of personal vehicles, you know, one issue here in Chicago, like right now there's a foot or two of snow out there. And so it would be very difficult to commute yeah. on a, well, just for the temperature and also the road conditions. Well, you know, yeah, I mean, like New York, we had just about as much, if not more snow in the last couple of weeks than Chicago. Yeah. We're probably on par. Actually, it's, yeah. it's been very warm the last few days here. So a lot of it has melted away. Thank God. Right. Um and there's a lot of sun too, which helps just being out and just killing it. But what do you sun. what do you do when it's ice and snow on the road? Are you able? Well, to we live. Fortunately, I don't know how Chicago handles stuff, but uh, fortunately, like New York City is just a monstrosity when it comes to clearing the roads. So yeah, they are like the moment before the first flake falls. There's a, a plow. there's there, there are plows out there. They're already running yeah. the streets. The, just yeah. just to, just so the moment it happens, they're plowing. They're dropping salt from the snow plows as well. So. Yeah. It gets salt city. I mean, sometimes you walk down the street, like maybe the snow is gone, but it's frigid temperatures, like 25 or below. And yeah. so they'll salt the streets then to prevent any kind of ice over. And you're walking the streets and a gust of wind blows and you're like, I, I taste yeah. the salt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but no, so as far as like riding these things, um, whether by, it's by, a, by the way, I'm an avid bike rider, so I, I ride like five thousand miles a year on my bike. Oh, you might be hard to convert I, then. I, but I don't, I don't do it in the uh, in the winter at all. Of course, you know, yeah. Not, and and even when it gets close to the winter, on either side of it, I that's the only time that I have accidents. You know, there's 
for instance, when we'll go, out. if I'm on a trail, um, and if you, there's a shady spot where there's a little bit of ice and right. you know, some black ice or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That happens uh, more often than I'd like. Yeah. I mean, so for me, like I rode, I'm, you know, really tied into the electric unicycle part of the PEV world. Um, so for us, you might think like how in the world on one contact point, are you even attempting to ride in inclement weather? But they certain ones ride pretty good in the rain and then in the snow, like my current everyday driver, my it's called the veteran Sherman. It uh, has a really good like knobby tire on it. So it oh, works nice. fairly well in the snow. I couldn't go through like deep snow, but like on the right. road that has been snowed upon, I've definitely ridden with that. Um, and then in the slush, yeah. obviously it's, you just can't go obviously as fast. You're just riding a bit right. slower. Like you might like with a car and heavy anything. downpour. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, so they kind of yeah. work themselves out there. But you make a great point, which is like I think only the most hardcore people in a metropolitan city would do this, which is like in inclement weather, who wants to be standing on a on a wheel or a scooter or whatever? Like getting smacked with yeah. rain or snow or, or just frigid well, temperatures. Or- yeah, minus, you know, below zero temperatures with the wind. and I can't. Chicago rough, is yeah. different. I mean, you guys yeah. are like right right on the water there, right? So yeah, yeah. that wind is probably gnarly, I'd imagine. Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah. But, uh, otherwise, I would do it because I've always had mopeds and scooters and people use them for like that. Yeah, like recreation is a big reason people buy these as well. Only I think there's a very smaller percentage of us that use it like as a daily driver. Um, right. And even for me, like... Th- if it's like a downpour rain, like if if I have to go semi far, I'm just taking an Uber. I'm I'm not yeah, right. I'm not gonna right. mess with it. Like I said, it's not comfortable to be riding in a heavy downpour on my unicycle. Even though we could do it, I'm still having to wear expensive REI rain gear and just right. getting pelted the whole time. Right. So that's Perfect. not really I fun. But I mean, for like recreation, which is what most people buy this for. Like we have a lot of friends in California and um, in um, like Washington and in Oregon, all, all over. People in Vegas I know who, who ride these things and then across the world. Um, it's, you know, on the weekend where maybe you would you and the kids might go out um, and like maybe go on a trail and ride your bike somewhere just for recreation. Obviously, yeah. devoid yourself of the of the um, exercise because you're not really going to get exercise with, with a PEV. But the fun, you know, being able to traverse somewhere together and see everything and, you know, go yeah, fast or you. slow or whatever. It's you. it's a unique experience. I agree. Riding it's a, it's through. It's the same with a bicycle, right? It's yeah. like you have no obstructions, you know, 360 degrees and you're part of everything around you. And it's it's a very it's a it's a much more enriching way to experience wherever you are. I would say well, a, P- a PEV it. gives you a lot of freedom. Um, and, and especially on like the unicycles and even some high powered scooters, uh, I'm not really into the scooter thing as far as like the high powered ones I've ridden rental scooters and, you know, some other personal right. scooters. I've done some reviews right. on it for my YouTube channel, but, um, I like to say for the electric unicycle, I'm getting a micro dose of adrenaline every time I ride. So yeah. like I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I can ride yeah. anywhere between 20 to 50 <laughs> miles an hour. So I'm not always at top speed. Yeah. Um, and don't tell the local government how fast I'm going. Um, right, but right. you know, like you get a lot of enjoyment, especially again, like, you know, I'm somebody who likes roller coasters and, and, you know, things <laughs> like that. So I totally get that. I, I mean, I, I use the electric scooters and get a similar thing out of that. And I'm not even going as fast as you, but yeah, I think that the fun. people see the unicycle and, and most people, when they first see it, they have one or two reactions, which is, well, wow, that's super cool. I want to learn more about this or, that seems crazy. Scary, There's yeah. no way I could learn that moving on. Right. Um, right. But what I would say is the barrier to entry seems high, but it's no different than learning a new um, sport like skiing, snowboarding, wakeboarding, something like that. If you've never done it before, there yeah. is a bit of a barrier to learn. So it's not right. it's not like a sport like soccer. Anybody can just start kicking a ball. Um, but you need to learn proper technique to right. ski or snowboard right. or wakeboard. It's like yeah. that. It just takes a few hours, a few days. Yeah. Depending on who you are, start and then, off in a in a parking lot. And mm-hmm. Wear some elbow pads or something. I mean, I wear pads yeah. every day now, like when I ride. Yeah. <laughs> um, depending on how aggressive or relaxed you make your experience when you ride, can yeah. determine how padded up you get. But yeah. I like to tell the people who ride in our community that the very least you should just have a helmet on uh, and some wrist guards. You probably get rid of the rest if you don't if you don't need it if you're not going crazy. Yeah. But myself. 
I ride like a maniac when I whenever I want. So I have a helmet, wrist guards, uh, a knee shin guard combo thing, um, and then sometimes I have like a um, there's a padded uh, jacket company called Lazy Rolling. Um, they make like a really nice looking jacket, but it has like pads and like the elbow and the shoulders well, and the back. Nice. Built so in. That's nice. yeah, I've seen people like. Wait, you, go ahead. I was just gonna ask. Do you go on the highway? Can you go on the highway? No. Is that against the law? <laughs> uh, is that, is that... I think it's against the law. Um, I don't know. Wink, wink. Uh, yeah. So yes, I've actually been on on New York well, City highways. What's the top speed? What's the top speed that you can get to? When you're so my speed? wheel, I can do fifty two. Personally, wow. I've only done 50 on it. But So here's the interesting part about an electric vehicle with a gyro compared to, a, say, a scooter that can do, let's say, 55, 60. They have wild ones that can do, like, 70 now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the difference is my wheel is also compensating and keeping me upright so that right. power draw has to ha- starts to have di- more dire consequences the closer you sure. get to that line, which draws a lot of guys into this. This is why they're in it. You know, like, they like sitting at that line there's a bit of that you know living on the edge feeling um i like to get kind of close to it but i don't like to like for example if i'm gonna go 50 if i'm gonna hit 50 it's for a specific reason maybe i'm racing a buddy and we go through what we call cutout tunnel i think it's it's the tunnel underground by the un and trump tower oh i know yeah i know exactly what you mean so we fly through there i'll hit 50 there only because it's sort of like a on a unicycle whatever your top end is of your specific unit that's right. I can tap yeah, it. Yeah. I'm not going to yeah. sustain that. But cool enough, I can sustain like 45 miles an hour on the West Side Highway of Manhattan, which is not really a highway. It's like a four-lane right. road that you might have right. in the suburbs. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I can sustain like 45 on that for like, I'd say from 34th Street down to like um, to Wall Street, to South Street Ferry or something. Um, so that's a unique feature of that high-end machine. But a lot of them are much smaller, much lighter uh, much yeah. more suited for like a leisurely, um, you know, like trek with your family or on your block or wherever. Go to the grocery store. So I have a lot of different ones for different things. So I have a smaller one we that keep in our apartment. Sense. What about going down hills, though? You could get going a lot faster, right? We, uh, weirdly, um, no, because if you think about the gyro is, is keeping you upright, like a Segway, which I'm sure you've probably seen, maybe even ridden. Right. So yeah. I can push as hard as I want going downhill, but ultimately if I stopped pu- pushing, it would not go as fast in the sense right. of it's, it's like symbiotically tied to you. So, right. um, well, it's, it's resisting like in the Teslas they have, um, I forget what they call it, but the braking, you know, it's automatically recharging the battery, right? Yeah. The Using regen the, braking, the resistance. Is, is that what you have on the, yeah. On the, I yeah. See. So, I mean, when I go downhill, I guess a better way to say is you don't need to worry about falling down the hill. Right. You'll right, naturally right. start going down. and it won't slow you down, but your body will naturally, like if you're looking down a hill, right? Like on a, a big, tall street in San Francisco, right. you're not going to walk this way down the hill, right? Your, uh, your hot, top half of your body is going to stand upright and your right. feet are going to be like stretched as you walk down the right. hill. Same thing right. applies here in the sense that you're not just going to lean and lose yourself right. like you're naturally right. going to lean back a bit which is going to enact the braking right so it's, it's how much do you like put pressure on your toes and lean forward will determine how fast you go yeah. so i mean not to say there isn't um some risk in this sort of thing but yeah it's a very freeing fun experience so like clearly there's a big community bursting globally around this the russians really have the biggest um electric unicycle community in the world wow are there races yet yeah, so I myself have hosted, um, we call them an EUC for short, an electric unicycle. I'm working to change that because it's kind of like a weird, it's, it doesn't flow off the tongue when you talk about it. But anyways, I hosted the first uh, ever EUC drag race here in New York. It was like an underground drag race. Oh, cool. Um, and now we're seeing, guys have now done like indoor go-kart track racing. And then in Russia, they've had massive outdoor F1 courses that they've done racing on. Um, so, so it's really starting to pick up, um, and especially that that's that's the interesting part, right? Like I said, you have a gyro holding you up. So, um, you're when you're doing like a race, there is a bit of a like a drag race, for example. If you take off from zero, at a certain point, you will draw too much power from your vehicle to where it'll what we call cut out. 
meaning the computer crashes right. internally and the gyro doesn't right. keep you up anymore and it's like face plant city. But why not disable the gyro for the races? No, I mean you it has to without the gyro it doesn't it doesn't work. It doesn't stand upright. Um so that's what's keeping you on the one wheel. But but it would if you if you use your own balance you could keep it No, up it's impossible. You? I mean you're you're right. you're talking about balancing on a 1 inch piece of metal basically at that point. <laughs> no one can right. No one can maneuver right. yourself forward while do, it would right. it would take you eons to figure out how to make that work. So Mickey, I do I do a ride every summer except for last summer. I've done it like seven years in a row called uh, Rag Rag Bry. Mm-hmm. It's the the Des Moines Registers annual great great bike ride across Iowa. It's oh cool! Four. But there's twenty thousand people that do this, and they go five hundred miles over a week on bicycles but all kinds of personal vehicles including some electric ones Mm. and anyway there are several people that do fall 500 miles we're talking going up and down some pretty big hills you'd be surprised i was got is hiller than than you would imagine sure and they do it on a unicycle oh a standard unicycle unicycle. wow that's not not without a gyro right all right got a manual unicycle wow yeah that's they must have killer core and legs (laughs) You're not gonna find. I don't know a, how they do it. You're yeah. not gonna find a fat guy doing that. That's right. that's for sure. Right. Yeah. So that's right. the thing. A lot of people like to think. Uh, usually, when they get into it, they'll ask someone who doesn't know what they're talking about and go, "So, am I am I getting a workout from this? Is is my?" And a well, lot of guys go. You are a little with your core, maybe. No. So that's the first thing everyone says is core. Yeah. yeah no. no. Zero uh, core. It's it is completely. If if anything at all. It, legs, it is your your calf, and and if you're yeah. an aggressive rider, maybe your thighs, your, thighs. Um, your quads. Well, you're absorbing you're absorbing the shock of the. Your of knees the road, are the shocks. Right? Your knees yeah. are the shocks. In the sense yeah. that, like, if you're in a nice road, you're not you don't feel anything. Yeah, if but, it's flat. Right? Yeah, but if you're on like a really awful road, the key is I, on a bad road at high speed, I ride like a jockey on a horse. So my knees are really just yeah. Cr- I'm crouching down like a jockey. Yeah. And it's just yeah. it's it's going well for me. If you were to stiff leg it for some reason, right. you, you would be bounced off. You, you would yeah. you would be bounced off of it. Yeah. yeah. Here in Chicago in the winter, especially, we get these monster potholes. Oh, and I that's bet. That's a problem even for cars. You know, I've had myself flat tires just from hitting the potholes. Yeah, if you're gonna. But I mean, as long as you're alert, you could try to navigate around them. Yeah, I like to but, say uh, that if high speed riding is is more akin to. Um, piloting a fighter plane yeah you can't you can't it at high speed you can completely use these casually so don't get don't don't confuse my enthusiasm for adrenaline um right, but right. at higher speeds you can't just casually ride we've seen guys right. try this it doesn't go well <laughs> right. i imagine at night too that could be a real problem yeah you know, a lot of these have the lights on them though no no on the adrenaline side if you're going oh really yeah fast at night it's hard to to scan ahead to see if there are obstacles, you know, little, mm-hmm. little obstacles. There's always something, yeah. But like, there are plenty of people, like my wife or my, uh, or just anyone else who's just not into the whole adrenaline side of it, and they're just into the right. freeing, just cruising, right. gliding thing. They, right. you know, they they love it. They love just kind of just coasting and riding around the neighborhood or whatever. So it's it just depends on who you are, I think, and how you want to maneuver the machine. You know, I feel like if, if the, the more you could could get people involved in the adrenaline side of it, you would get more publicity for the sport. I mean, this on is its own. You th- know, like you're X true. game type type things. Yeah, I mean, you there's stunts. this is something that um, you're right. You're spot on with that. I agree that. Yeah. So, like, there's a guy in Russia. His name is Phantomus, and weirdly enough, maybe maybe because he speaks Russian only, and all of his stuff is you know, like Russian based or whatever, but like he's doing big, um, drop-ins to like big, um, bowls, s- bowls and, um, yeah. half pipes and all that kind of stuff. And he's doing cool. wild stuff, but weirdly, here's the, here's the thing we talk about all the time to us. It's impressive. Right. But if you show a skater for yeah. the first second, they're like, well, that's interesting. But then they're like, yeah. well, yeah. when we all do skating, we do same, insane right? yeah. tricks. Like, you know, a 1080 with a hard flip back <laughs> nolly, like in, it just gets wild. Right. You're just like, yeah. like I you can't do a backflip on this on, on a jump. It wouldn't work. The gyro is designed to shut off 
when it's upside down. Right, like, right. he would be sc- We've talked about the logistics of trying to do something. It wouldn't work. But you're right about that. Like, we, the racing is a big thing. New yeah. York City specifically is very known controversially for our high adrenaline speed um, obsession yeah. on these things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's mainly because we have a intriguing traffic situation. So when I ride in traffic every day up 6th Avenue, I can fly and zoom and bob and weave between cars, kind of like old yeah. bike messengers. Yeah, um, sure. I came from a fixed gear bike background. Um, so, But people in like Denmark yell at us on the internet. You're going to get us banned for riding like this. And I yeah, just there is that. simply say, if the Denmark government, the Danish government, looks at someone's silly Instagram video, video <laughs> in New York City and think, because of that, they should ban it for you. Then I'm sorry, you live in a bad country. I mean, like that's now. If you were doing it in Denmark and breaking all the Denmark rules, and they want to ban it, fine. That makes a lot more sense. But they often yell at New York. And well, we're used to all it. The bicycle deaths every year. It's it's thousands of people, and yeah, they're not going to ban bicycles. But I did see the video. I bet you did too. That Casey Neistat made. Made. It's one of my favorite videos where he gets a ticket for riding in the bike lane yeah. because he swerved out of the bike lane in Manhattan. Still and true then, to this day. Uh, right, but then, remember, and then so what he does is they show him riding in the bike lane. He says, you have to, you can't be in the bike lane because there's obstructions. And then he goes on to show he just rides in the bike lane runs right into things. <laughs> yes. And Do you remember that? It's yeah, it's a very video. famous video. <laughs> yeah. Um, man, I want to say it's like over 15 years old now, that video. It's a, it's a lot. That's, that's, I think that might have been like his first viral video. Yeah, I think it might have been, you know, yeah. just getting started, yeah. It's a great it's one. Funny. Thankfully, to this day, to my knowledge, you, you cannot, or at least they're not giving him out, a ticket for being outside the bike lane on a bike. No, no issue if you have to ride into traffic. I've never in the last five, ten years seen that happen. Um I can't say, well, never, but I, I personally have not yeah. seen it. But the obstruction situation still exists. People still yeah. uh, park, you know, stop, unload right. stuff in the bike lane. They Pedestrians yeah, will sure. just walk out on their cell phones sure. looking at their phone into the bike yeah. lane. Yeah. It's still an issue. But it's more a factor of, like, the bike lane situation was an afterthought for New York City compared to maybe a Scandinavian country where it's, like, right. the main right. feature. It's integral, right. Yeah. They, they, they ride bikes there. What about what about riding your you know the the controversy between uh, trails and uh, like in New York the uh, I forget what it is so right Chelsea Market you know the the uh, the elevated you know uh, oh on the High can, Line yeah like can you take electric powered vehicles on things like that or are they I, I would imagine no I w- I've never uh, tried to go ride that no uh, being like someone who's lived here as long as I, like I've been here like 12, 13 years. I know the Highline very well and like what the aura is. It's a bunch yeah. of leisurely people walking around. Like right, it, it wouldn't right, actually sure. be fun um, right. to ride that right. unless it was empty, maybe. Right. Um, right. But, but can you use sidewalks and things where like non powered, ve- you know, like bicycles would maybe use? So in, in these. Yeah. So in New York, what probably different from Chicago is um, bicycles technically are not allowed on the sidewalk ever. That's a pedestrian right. place, and right. that's why we have right. a bike lane now, right? However, obviously, like, bikes and or an electric vehicle of some sort needs to ride on the sidewalk for whatever reason. I don't really think you're going to get a ticket, really. I've heard right. more pedestrians just angrily yell at people. Yeah, like, the, like the, the, the other night, I have to get onto my sidewalk to go to my apartment. Like, there's a part where right. I have to right. do this. Right. And as I was, I got on the sidewalk some woman goes, you know, you should really be in the street. And so right, I stopped and I said, right. you mean the street that I just rode for three miles from my office over in Dumbo? I mean, that street where I was in traffic. You have a problem with the fact that I had to get on my sidewalk to go to my building, which is right here. And she was like, you don't have to be mean about it. I was like, maybe you shouldn't be mean about it and close your mouth. I mean, you're being ridiculous. Uh, maybe that was a, New, a that, New York moment, but I was going to say that sounds like New York. I love it. I love <laughs> just like, <laughs> just close your mouth and mind your business. Also, also I wasn't even like near you or like going right, to run into right. you. Like, and that's right. the, the very fascinating part about the unicycles compared to a, maybe a bicycle. I don't really take up literally any more space than me standing up. Yeah. I'm right. just, it's like me right. floating on air and you're mad that I'm just moving slightly faster than a walk. 
on the right. sidewalk there. But yeah, like my wife rides on the sidewalk only. She's afraid of being in the bike lane. So if she's riding just, you know, around the neighborhood, just having a good time. She's just cruising slow on, on the sidewalk. So it's yeah. no one is ever in an official capacity going to say something to her. Yeah. And you, and so you can use all the bike lanes, any, any kind of a, a, a lane designated. Mm-hmm. And what do you, but I guess you, you have a choice. You could ride in the street or in the bike lane. I almost never side. choose the bike lane personally. Oh, wow. De- I guess, it yeah, it's depends. more dangerous, right? You, it can, you it can be for more obstructions. It, it, it's an interesting topic because it can be um, like I like use my wife as an example because she's just a moderate rider. Um, for her, that is the safest place to be in the bike right. lane. She's not riding fast. Or slow. Right. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it would be either dangerous or fun, depending on how you look at it, to ride the bike lane because all the obstructions you can imagine of pedestrians or cars or whatever are going to exist there. So if I'm flying and other cyclists, I got to maneuver around all of those things and potentially could be a hazard to me or somebody else. So I often choose the street. Depends on the road I'm on. Um, But some guys think it's, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. They think it's fun. They'll ride at a a speed which works for them to make it feel like they're in a video game. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I I like to be technical and ride around these obstacles. And That's me. I'm like you. I love that. That's that's what what I like about the whole thing. It's great. Yeah, so it it can be very... Your experience is what you make it, basically. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, d- cool. yeah. Do you think, I mean, I know we kind of kidded, but do you think in the future you would potentially, just for leisure purposes, get a scooter or something of that nature? I've had many scooters and electric scooters and mopeds and things like that. So I'm 100% on the, on the, the you know, on the fence about mm. about the unicycle. But... The, we, we did, there was a, I, don't, I think the car company went out of business, but there was one electric car company, which was only a two-wheel car. Mm. I don't know if you remember this. I think it was out of Manhattan. And the gyroscopes were such that it would stand on two wheels, and, but it had it had this. doors. And you could, you could push it, and it would fall over and not hit the ground and bounce back up. You know, it had, I miss it this. was stable. It was really <laughs> cool. And we, we actually, it was one of those things where it was a technology that I thought was cool. And wow. we offered to work with them and they, they were raising money. And I, I don't know if that they ever really, you know, were able to make it. But yeah, um, those gy- people don't really understand the gyroscope technology that that can balance, you know, the way that that. It's a bit of magic, works. though. Yeah. It, it looks like magic, doesn't it? You know, it's yeah. a, a force that you can't see, you know. So, so. Um, it's an interesting backstory the, of how it came about, too. What's the backstory? Uh, so that. the designers of like the original Segway, this, I guess would be the the genesis of it all. They were trying to create. Um, so I guess the whole thing was like the inventor saw that people in wheelchairs could never be at the level of you and I. Right. So they always had to look up to people. So they were trying to create a wheelchair that when you came up to somebody, if you wanted to greet them, it would raise up and be able to balance yeah. on two wheels so that you could almost stand, basically, and shake someone's hand at their eye level. Uh-huh. Somewhere along the way, while they were trying to figure this out, I think they kind of maybe had an iteration of that, but eventually abandoned it and created the, uh, the, the Segway. Right. right. What was his name? He was a famous inventor. Uh, I can't remember his name right now. Uh, and he actually died, I think, riding his Segway, right? Yeah, I think that was... I don't remember if that was the original inventor or one of the like uh-huh. co-founders. Oh, maybe, at, yeah. At this, maybe at, but the yeah, he, guy. and then famously, was it George W. Bush who, who fell off the Segway, uh, like, on, on TV? I remember something like that. Uh, yeah. I think that the headline, the media ran with it was, like, because I guess the Segway people were saying, like, you can't fall off of it, which in general is basically true. <laughs> but the best part was when George Bush yeah. went to mount it, um, it wasn't on. So, so that... That is true right. if it's on. You basically right. can't fall off. But the gyro was not engaged, so he just, like, fell over right. the front. <laughs> so, yeah. That's funny. For sure. Actually, you know, remember Back to the Future? He was – you you started off, we were talking about that. Remember, he was riding the, the hoverboard. Mm. You know, and that's almost there. That's actually something that's uh, it is. almost here. Well, yeah. we – a lot of uh, the people in this nerd community basically um, – hate that terminology because of I like to put frame it this way I like to put my fist up to the sky and say well we never really got our hoverboard first of all it's not here yet 
Okay, right. so stop calling these electrified um, gyro vehicles hoverboards. Because remember, we had oh, that. Oh, they the, call that? They call well, the, it, the original, before EUCs were like around, um, oh, you know, we had the hoverboard thing. It was just the two wheel. It was a big Christmas gift, remember, for everybody. Right, they right. caught fire caught a lot. Fire, right, right. So to this day, people go, oh, is that a hoverboard? And you're like, <laughs> no, it is not. I didn't know that. <laughs> it's like, I didn't know that. It's like, Every EUC rider hates that term, but I see. You know the hoverboards to this day are still made, uh, but the biggest problem they had was twofold. Number one, Segway actually fixed it because they came out with a smaller, reduced Segway called the. Well, Segway was bought by Ninebot, so it's called the Ninebot, or no, actually it's called the Segway Mini Pro. So it's a shrunken Segway that just fits between your legs, basically. So that was their answer to the hoverboard. But the reason the hoverboards are kind of a disaster is number one. Your feet are not on the same plane. So the way you turn is you dip a foot forward. Right, right, and so, right. but you can imagine if you're riding and you don't realize that your foot kind of slumps a little bit, all of yeah. a sudden now it's turning and then your body is mass is still going forward. And so right. people would fall and break their arms. Right. Where Segway's Mini Pro fixed that, where the way you turned is there's like this little jo uh, joystick in the middle that your knee taps so that you turn. So your feet are always on the same plane. Um, but the other big thing with the fires was they didn't have a battery management system, so there was no BMS on it. So people would plug it in overnight to charge, go to sleep. And so once it hit 100, it was like a cartoon where it was still trying to shove energy wow, into that lithium terrible. battery yeah. and then boom. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, those gave us all a bad name. <laughs> yeah. But I, I'm big, curious. Big Christmas present for a while. Oh, yeah. People still buy them for yeah. their kids. And I try. they think I'm being a snob when I go, please don't buy that for your child. <laughs> for a little bit more money, yeah. I can convince you to buy the Mini Pro, which is professionally made by Segway. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so How what do you. Is a mini, how much is a Mini Pro? Uh, expensive? Uh, about five, six hundred bucks, depending on. Oh, that's you get all it. they are? Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. I, wow. Originally, the hoverboards were the same. But I, I believe they probably dropped to like 200 bucks now. So so people are like, right. well, it's 200 bucks. I can spend that for Christmas. You're like, right. listen, for a little more, you'll get a lot more enjoyment out of it and safety right. for your child if, right. if, if you buy this thing. Right. Um, do you? So I'm curious what you know about, I don't know much about it, solid state batteries. Uh, I feel like that would be a real future in EVs, whether it's a car or these yeah. things that we ride. Yeah, you know, Elon Musk talks about it all the time, and a lot of people smarter than, than I am talk about it. And solid state is a new technology that's being worked on. And, you know, essentially the, the amount of minerals that we have in the earth, including the NIMBY that we talked about that people don't want to mine in their backyard for lithium, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's being worked on. And it seems like these things are, are, are a lot of people are very doom and gloom about uh, the proliferation of EVs and other devices that are using these batteries that we, we can't possibly, you know, get there with, with what we have today. And, and, you know, there's all of this innovation and technology to create batteries that don't use as much of those resources or like solid state and other technologies where perhaps they use none of those resources mm. and they condense the size and the weight and they increase the range and, and that battery technology has been going on, and it's almost like um, like Moore's Law with chips. You know, it's, it's always advancing. And so I don't know what that's going to look like, but it, it is changing, and it has to change because we, we would run out of cobalt and lithium and the things that, that go into these batteries. And yeah. they're also working on the existing batteries to reduce the amount of those uh, items that are, that are, you know, precious or rare type of minerals they go into them they're they're reducing i think elon musk was saying that he thought that tesla would be down to two percent so that only two percent of the battery was lithium wow. so it was, you know it's getting smaller and smaller it would be more nickel and then eventually or something. zero he didn't I, i'm not aware of what what would replace it or sure how that works but you know they're they've got smart chemists and scientists and they're working on those solutions and um there's just been a lot of innovation in that space i've I've invested in and been working with a lot of different battery companies over the years. So I've, I've seen, you know, batteries that were the size of my desk. Now they're down to the, you know, it's yeah. amazing how far things have come. So I imagine that's going to continue. Yeah, I think. And, uh, you know, it'll, it'll get worked out somehow. I don't know how. The, I think the next out. iteration we need, though, before that probably is 
some some there's been different methods talked about, but just a, some iteration that is a sort of fireproof version of a battery. That's a big that's a big problem. Yeah, people you yeah. Know, are worried about it catching on fire. I haven't seen a Tesla fire a, yet. Have there been any? There, there have be a been. Few. There, there, you know that at the beginning, that was the the biggest uh, negative to Tesla's is they'll catch on fire, they'll explode, and mm. and but there've been a lot less fires in Tesla's as I remember Tesla talking about than than uh, even on a per capita basis than there were in regular ICE cars. Mm. I mean, you're going to have some cars crash and explode. Um, no matter sure. what it is, because they have combustibles in them. So it isn't necessarily, they, they haven't had a big problem with it. They're very fortunate because that was one of the things that the companies that wanted Tesla to fail were, were you know, were hoping. And, and uh, when, when something would happen, they would really uh, get a lot of publicity about that, about fires and the batteries right. exploding and all of those things. I, I remember a key moment. Um, uh, there was some event or something that Elon was talking at. Um, I, I'm probably going to butcher the exact words that they had said, but I remember someone was, t- he might've been up there on a panel or something like that. And somebody was suggesting from the audience, it was Q and a or something like that, that, um, that, uh, methane was really the future and that electricity was a joke. And that, I mean, they're like challenging Elon directly at this like panel. And they were saying like, listen, yeah. you, you can't solve the storage problem. You can't, there aren't enough charging places. This was probably like five, 10 years ago that they were like really challenging him. And I remember, you know, arguably I'm a fanboy of, of Elon, yeah. but um, yeah, like his answer was pretty awesome. You should find it on YouTube. I forget how you, I don't know how you would look this up, but he just kind of like looked at them as far well and was like, they were like, what do you have to say, Elon? And he was just like, they'll see. They're wrong and they'll see. He says that a lot. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, if you hate Elon, that's a moment where you go, what a smug prick, right? But if you love Elon, you're like, yes, he got him. He was right. He the, with, with, with autonomous driving regarding LIDAR, he, mm. that was the same exact response. He said something how a lot of the autonomous driving platforms are using LIDAR, or, you know, this form of radar rather than than, than visual than video to, to analyze and to navigate. And he said, uh, he goes... Well, we, we, we have some LIDAR technology, he says, but really to use LIDAR for autonomous driving is a fool's errand. This is what he said. And he said, and then somebody, I believe maybe somebody asked him how to say it. He goes, I, we, we've done, we've spent thousands of hours t- working with it. It just isn't possible. It doesn't work. You'll see. <laughs> it's interesting because, you know, currently someone informed me that uh, GM and some of the other companies that that's what they're diving yeah. into for their smart technology yeah. is LIDAR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you consider yeah, it, yeah. if you consider just for a moment, basically what they would have to do is, I know it's, go with me here. They have to map the planet with you. the yeah, 3D yeah, yeah. objects. They'd have to identify every image and, 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 link and it's it to ever it. changing yeah. too. So like Seems, the smart yeah. technology that, that right. Tesla has, the AI they have makes a right. lot more sense um, because I like to give this example in New York City after lockdown in order to compensate and help the city survive a bit. Um, Mayor de Blasio allowed for outdoor dining, right, which is not a thing we ever had in New York. As a Floridian right. originally, I was right. amazed at how little outdoor dining there was. Every restaurant yeah. in Florida has an out, a backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so they built these, you know, I guess you would call them just like carports, really, where you could eat on the sidewalk yeah. or in the street. Uh, oftentimes, yeah, same, same here. Chicago, so, yeah. so like if uh, you know GM had mapped the planet pre-COVID, and you were driving your car down the same street, it wouldn't know that those things now exist there, right. and you might be SOL. Right. <laughs> You're just like mowing down a restaurant, basically. Right, right. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I mean. Actually, I think Elon knows more than most other people do, and I just yeah. trust him with that. But I can tell you, my car driving autonomously has not necessarily saved my life, but I've avoided accidents that I think it's it's hard to know hypothetically. But I feel that if I were driving, I would have gotten an accident. Mm. And the fact that my car was driving, it saw things coming that I wouldn't have. And and by the way, my my car is rarely on its cell phone. <laughs> and I sometimes <laughs> am. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. um, in the future, I, I mean, I want to know what you think on this too. My prediction is 
most people won't actually own cars in the future. It'll be that'll be a, a luxury, um, and gas powered will be sort of like owning um, a record player. Very few people have it. The people who are super fans will have you know a gas powered muscle like car. Going to, uh, how, how about this one? It'll be like going to Blockbuster to rent a video. Yeah. Exactly. Instead of going to Netflix and just watching what you want to watch. I, I think that the cars will be uh, always moving and traveling around. And then when you need a car, it'll be like an Uber type experience where you tell it, yeah. come, come get me. And then right. if the car needs to go charge or, or whatever, it goes back to where I think we're going to have massive um, Skynet level parking garages next to or inside of city centers where these things will be able to park, um, charge up when they need to. And then this is a thing I'm curious about. Although I'm predicting this future, how are they going to keep it cleanly? You know, if everyone is sort of renting a car and we all don't own one, we had a car share thing here called Car to Go. I don't know if they had it in Chicago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have it everywhere. Once it became, well, they, they're, I think they're gone now out of New York, I believe. Is, is that right? Wow. Yeah, I, I actually think they went bankrupt. I think that's what happened. Oh, I didn't but, know that. I've um, seen them all over. After it became popular, it's like ubiquitous that into the outer boroughs, everybody knew about it. They became disgusting very fast. What early adopters are using it, it was beautiful. I loved it. Right, right. So I, I'm they were not passionate sure. Passionate about it. Yeah. I'm not sure how we're gonna. If know. that is the future, how we're gonna keep the cars clean? Yeah, I, that that I, I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. I imagine if you think about it, it'll become more like mass transportation, and so it probably won't be as clean as if it's your own mm. car that you own, but. But that's a small price to pay compared to just, you know, like, like these cars are these massively expensive pieces of equipment, which use tons of carbon. Even if they're electric, they use tons of carbon just to produce them. And they're just sitting still most of the time. Right. I mean, like 23 out of 24 hours a day, they're sitting still taking up space. It doesn't make it's not an efficient way to move move people around the planet. That's for sure. And And the idea of autonomous driving cars could really be the future or a big piece. I mean, obviously we'll still have mass transportation and trains and all those things, but um, it makes a lot of sense to me. And I, I think they would only need to be parked to charge up or to get fuel, whatever that fuel is, whether sure. it's gas or otherwise they could be out driving around, you know, and then you don't even need to park it. Right. You know, you, Driveways you, you will be silly. <laughs> I, I could see that. I, I would, uh, I would go short Parking garages, you mm -hmm. know, right now. I wouldn't want to be long parking garages. Yeah, I, I, I think it could be a fascinating future um, just to see. And that really gets back to like sort of like what I imagine, like a Disneyfied or even back to the futurified version of the future, you know. Um, uh, I think the last thing is just what do you what do you think is the going to be the future for you, for your company um, in the energy space? What 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 lies ahead? So I, I've got my three, three of my four kids work for me. So I think about the future a lot. My wife works with me too. And uh, I, I feel we are heading towards that Jetsons. Kind of, or what was that? What did you say? Did you say Jetsons or what did you say? You said something. Oh, I was talking back to the future. Or back to the future. Yeah. yeah like, like a, a, and it's so exciting to Blade me. Runner. It reminds me a lot of the, exactly. All of those futuristic things were really getting there and i see it and and it exists today a lot of it's not economical but it's for sure coming it's just a matter of the chips becoming less expensive and the mm. materials becoming more available and the miniaturization and the battery technology and it's all happening so i'm really excited to see that and where i think there's a opportunity for for me and my my children and my children's children is to figure a way to help connect people to it because all of the geniuses, maybe other than Elon Musk, you know, the, the geniuses that create some of this technology, they're not business people. They're not they're not sales people. They're not marketers. They're mm. they're inventors. They're chemists. They're they're scientists. You know, and so electrical engineers. You know, I wouldn't want an electrical engineer to run my business, but I want them to invent the technology. And that's what's that's I believe, generally speaking, where we are right now at this point in time. And so we're trying to play the other role, which is trying to, to, to put those devices and those technologies and the financing and the engineering and all that and put it together in a seamless way, like on your phone, where you click very few clicks mm -hmm. and you can engage with all of that. Because 
it's it's complicated, you know, and it's hard for for consumers to to figure it out. And there are bad actors out there in all of these different things. I'm sure even in the in the uh, unicycle, the electric unicycle mm-hmm. vehicle. Um, so, so you need somebody to to sort of vet out the bad actors and find the best of breed technologies and put it together in a way that like 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 Steve Jobs did with the cell phone. He really changed the way people interact with their phones with sure. just by having a, a more elegant way of and simplified way of putting it together. So that's what we're trying to do with the whole clean tech space. And when I have conversations with people they, they kind of they don't even understand it. But, but but we're getting we're getting closer. People starting to get it because uh, it's very difficult if you wanted to have a solar system and you had to really figure out how to, how to work it and to figure out what makes the most sense and combine that with batteries and what makes sense and now combine that with the grid right. to, to help you sort of gamify it by using power at times of day that where there's where it's plentiful and not using it or even feeding power back to the grid when they need it and maybe earning money and having more efficient devices whether it's a thermostat or or your lighting solutions and all of that right and to put all that together i'm the there's very few people doing that and i'm not sure why because i'm i'm fearful that google is going to come in and compete with me and some of these larger companies even like apple but right. in the meanwhile we've we, we're like tesla we've got a several year head start we're putting that together we have a bunch of customers including like fortune 500 you know some of the bigger customers that have trusted us to do that for them so we can afford the r&d to put these things together mm-hmm. and i'm i'm optimistic that we're going to get there and we're working every day on it so that's what gets me out of bed in the morning yeah, man. It's exciting stuff. Thank you for yeah. talking to me about this. It's kind of like Thank a... Thank you for, for, your, for being on your show. I've really enjoyed it. I appreciate it. Yeah. This is like really cool just to really like... The whole purpose of like I've told you before we started this, the whole purpose of like this podcast is to really dive into all aspects of, of electric uh, technology and all that kind of stuff. Not just whatever personal yeah. thing you're riding. Um, so it's yeah. really enlightening. And I'm, you know, you kind of mentioned it, but you know, I've talked to a lot of people about like a lot of my viewers maybe don't know like there are better times of day to charge their EV than others. You know, th- right. little things like there's little things I think we're right. all gaining but, information. Right, but Mickey, you could you could learn that and you could study it and you could try to go onto the utilities uh, platform and figure it out. Good luck. It's almost <laughs> impossible. But I can I can instead make it in such a way where the utility will talk through AP, you know through software with APIs mm-hmm. together with your the software that runs your charger and it'll just automatically do it and you won't have to worry about it gotcha. so like at night it'll be charging but only at the times when the wind's blowing and they have too much power and if they don't use it they'll have to throw it away genius and, but it, it has to be done in a way that you don't have to even think about it yeah of course because you've got other things to do other things to worry about Awesome. So that's that's really what what are what we're all about. So if people uh, want to reach out to you um, and your company and are interested in maybe yeah. doing doing some work with you or maybe I don't know they just want to we're hi- we're hiring if get a job wants to, to sell energy we we're right now hiring about five people a week so almost a person a day. Are you doing a remote thing outside of Chicago? Yeah, we're in we're in all fifty states and we're in a few countries as well, uh, mostly in these twenty deregulated states, but mm-hmm. but literally all fifty states. Anyway, but Energy CX, so just Google us or mm-hmm. we're LinkedIn, all those social media platforms. EnergyCX.com is our website. And uh, if, if that interests anybody who's watching this, love to have you. And if you want to follow him on Clubhouse, I'm sure he's on at all times of the day. <laughs> so, no, I got I to gotta stop. It's addicting, <laughs> that thing. I'm weaning myself from it. But it is, it's a nice platform. Yeah, it's cool. Like, you know, there are tons of things being talked about, not just – EV stuff, but uh, like yeah. the other day, there was a bunch of doctors talking about coronavirus vaccines and things like that. I, I was, saw that. I was like, I let me dive that. into this, and um, it was cool. I got to ask somebody a question. That's the coolest part is like I got to just physically yeah. ask somebody yeah. a question who yeah. I would never get to connect with um, yeah. about something I know nothing about. You know, right? Uh, every all day, every day, it's a bit. The, two nights ago, I was on, and Jeff Garland from Curb Your Enthusiasm, mm-hmm. you know who that is? Yeah, yeah. He, and I, I'm a sort of a Curb fan, and I just saw it, so I clicked the button, and I'm talking to Jeff Garland about, you know, 
scripts and how That's they wild. made the. It's crazy, isn't it? I love yeah. it. Yeah. I th- somebody is already trying to rip them off too, right? Is it Twitter or Instagram or somebody. Fa- Facebook. Facebook is coming out with their own version. Mark yeah. Zuckerberg doesn't have a original <laughs> thought in his body. That's a good point. That's he's, all he does is just he's good at that. Rip right? off everybody else from Win- Winkle, pays money. Winklevosses and now the uh, yeah. Now these guys with Clubhouse. Totally. I mean, he's, that's he just. Oh, I got a lot of money. Let me take it. <laughs> you know. Right. Right. Anyways, uh, this has been a good conversation. Thank you yeah, again so much for, for coming on. And uh, we'll have you back again at some point. Maybe we'll meet up in the future. Maybe I'll teach you how to ride something. Maybe you can give me a ride at, or I'll ride behind you and learn. Yeah. In, yeah. In Manhattan. I'd be happy to do that. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you so Very much. Good. Thank you, Mickey. Once again, thank you so much for watching, guys. We appreciate you making it to the end. Maybe you skipped through, maybe you didn't. Either way, I appreciate you. Please consider subscribing to this YouTube channel, or if you're listening on an audio platform, please consider following this podcast. And if you really like it, go ahead and leave us a five-star review if you can, if you can figure it out. I know some platforms are kind of weird about it, how to get there to leave the review, but it would mean so much to me if you could leave a review on this podcast, as it will empower us to be higher ranked and continue to make more and more and more of these. So thank you so much for watching and we'll see you on the next one.